Hi, I'm Colin Mockery, and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. That's very good. I'm a professional. You are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't seem improvised at all. It seemed like you've been rehearsing that for years. Yeah, and yet I just did it. You did? All I needed was your name, the name of your show, which luckily uh, was fairly similar. Yeah. And then welcome. My full name is Show, so yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. Exactly. So Colin Mockery, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. It's a nice, crisp, almost Canadian kind of morning yep. here in uh, London. So That's it's why I arranged for you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, and some lovely uh, Christmas music playing, so yeah. it's, it's, it's lovely. I spent days dressing this hotel Christmassy. I have to say, you have done an amazing job. Thank you so much. So you've been on quite a trip so far. You've been to Australia, all over Europe. Are you, you still feeling energized? Yeah, actually, for like an old guy, I'm I'm feeling pretty good. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, Greg Proops, uh, Brad Sherwood, and I were just in Australia, New Zealand, doing some shows there. Then we flew back. The next day, Brad and I had a show in Milwaukee. Wow. Did that, and then the next day, my wife and I left for uh, Vienna. Uh, for part of our 30th anniversary European tour. Happy anniversary, by the way. Thank you. She's worked very hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, she has. It's, it's all worked out nicely. That's fantastic. Yeah. No, she's a great woman. Now, you get yeah, her early. She's very lovely. Yeah. yeah. And she makes very good uh, first impressions. She does. Yeah. She, she did loads of them, didn't she? She did Sean Connery. She did Rod Stewart. She did lots of impressions. Spice Girls. Oh, her baby spice is something to behold. It's incredible. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> now, you were you were born in Scotland, weren't you? And then you moved to, I want to say, Quebec. Oh, um, do you sort of consider uh, the UK to be your second home? Oh, absolutely. I always, uh, I still have family in Scotland. Uh, we've done shows for the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, so every time I come back there, I feel immediately at home. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I love the UK. I love London. Uh, I love uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. I feel, uh, I love the people here. They, I love, everyone seems interesting, even if they're not. We don't have that in North America. Usually if you go, oh, that's a dull person, they are dull. But in England, it's everyone has stories, and they're all great storytellers. Yeah. That's right. We all live in a castle, and it's amazing. And they always tell these incredible stories, and it usually ends with, "But that's not the worst of it." And then it goes <laughs> into some whole other dimension of, yeah. yeah. Then I made eye contact with someone in the elevator. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Now, like most people I interview, you used to want to be a marine biologist. Yes, uh, that happens a lot with the people you interview? Mate, yeah, 100% of the people today. Um, it, is, uh, it is what I wanted to do. And oddly, uh, Brad Sherwood, who I um, tour with, he also wanted to be a marine biologist. So I don't know This is what I mean. Yeah, I don't know if there's a um, correlation between improv and um, the, the love of marine... Uh, culture. Yeah, there's something fishy going on, isn't there? It, oh, you've done this before. No. Oh, yeah, I have technically done this before. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, obviously that didn't work out for me, yeah. which is probably a good thing for everyone concerned. Right. Um, but, you know, I still, uh, I stu still love the ocean, yeah. the water, dolphins. I love dolphins. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. I mean, I love water. I drink it most days. It's very good to keep hydrated. People uh, underestimate the importance of drinking a lot of water, but it's very good for you. Public service announcement. Oh, yeah. It's not just uh, learning about me, but it's learning about you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, how, how did you first get attracted to comedy and more specifically improvisational comedy? Um, I was always uh, you know a big fan of movies and uh, when I was growing up it, I feel like I was watching television 24 hours a day yeah. uh, uh, mostly comedies um, and in Canada we had the uh, great situation of we had all the great comedies from America all the great comedies from um, the UK and we understood both of them yeah. you know we, we got Monty Python before uh, US not only did we get it but we actually got the humor yeah. so uh, I was always attracted to comedy and then when I finally decided I wanted to be uh, an actor and went to theater school I found comedy was the thing that um, seemed very easy for for me and um, that I had a sort of a knack for so it just built from then and then uh, improv really wasn't a thing 
when I was young. <laughs> there was actually, um, there was maybe one person doing it. All of life was pre-scripted. <laughs> exactly. It was a weird time. Everything was black and white. Yeah. Oh, you would have hated it. And then I saw this demonstration of a thing called Theatre Sports, which... Uh, In Vancouver. Um, yes. Um, created by an English person, um, Keith Johnstone. And I, uh, again, being a very lazy person, thought, oh, this is good. You just show up, yeah. say whatever you want and then leave um, and got involved with that um, it started off slow in Vancouver and then within a year it was the big cult thing it was uh, very popular and then uh, you know 40 years later I got a career so incredible yeah. which is weird you're only in your mid-twenties it is weird I, yeah. uh, I I got up to like 30 and then worked my way back it's the best way it is <laughs> again water that's the secret it's, yeah just you're so hydrated yeah <laughs> Now you've also, you've known Ryan Stiles since the early 80s as well. What's he sort of been like to work with? Yeah, he's all right. Yeah. Um, Ryan was, um, when I first met him, he, he was doing stand-up. And um, I don't think he would mind me saying this. He wasn't like a great stand-up. Right. But a lot of his act was actually just talking to the audience. And then that's where he was really funny, riffing. And then uh, we sort of got together doing some improv and we clicked from day one and um, became very good friends. And he was sort of instrumental in many things in my life. Through him, I got an audition at Second City, the famous uh, sketch troupe in Toronto, where I got hired by the woman who became my wife. Amazing. So, yeah, so in a way he was responsible for that. Uh, he got me an audition for Whose Line, so he's responsible for that. And... Uh, Maybe the birth of my child. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask Deb about that. See how tall the kid gets and then... Yeah, be okay. Yeah. Normal size nose. Good. Yeah. <laughs> now you, um, which brings me neatly on to, uh, you were in a musical of the Brady Bunch. <laughs> yes, yes I was. Uh, yes, there was a big thing in the, uh, I guess the 90s, uh, that this, uh, I think it started with a group in Chicago and then was sort of spread all across the um, uh, nation. And by the time we got to Toronto, it was done by this woman who was just, um, had an unhealthy obsession with the Brady Bunch. And um, she really just f basically focused on the three uh, girls, the, the sisters, and made sure that and uh, I was playing the father and uh, you know I kind of looked like this I looked nothing like uh, him so I said can I have like maybe a wig or something she said no so I went to a um, wig store that sold wigs for um, basically Jamaican people yeah. <laughs> you know like in the Brady Bunch yes uh, so I was playing the, uh, Mr. Brady at the point where he had his perm <laughs> so I got this uh, very nice uh, little wig that made it look, uh, at least made me feel like I was closer to the spirit of Mr. Brady. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, that Jamaican side that people don't really um, associate that much. I mean, it's, it's very subtle, but I did sort of detect that in him. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, moving on to whose line is it anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, you first debuted I believe in the third series interestingly in an episode filmed in New York no 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 that's incorrect my first episode was it was in um, what we call London uh, now and that makes sense yeah we called it London then I believe uh, so I uh, flew over they were filming, they would always film on the weekend. So there was a show Saturday, a show Sunday. I was filming on the show Saturday. And uh, Mike McShane, Tony Slattery, and um, Sandy Toxvic were the three. And they were all lovely. Uh, but I sort of psyched myself out because I, th I thought, oh my God, I don't, I, you know, even though we speak the same language, will they understand my references? So um, I didn't have a great show. And before the show, Dan Patterson, the producer, said, uh, we'll do the show today. And if it goes well, you'll do the show tomorrow. Uh, I went, great. After the show, he said, so you're leaving Monday, are you? Oh. So I felt <laughs> that maybe it hadn't gone as well as I'd hoped. Right. But then uh, they decided to do some shows in New York. Yes. And that's really where I got my second chance. Uh, because I think Ryan Stiles, once again, said, you know, uh, give Colin another chance. So w they did bring me back, and they put me on the show with Ryan, 
who I'd worked with for years and so yeah. very relaxed and also we were in the States and the British people were actually feeling a little uh, off balance so it, it worked out for me. It's fantastic. Yeah. Very glad it did. Oh me too because otherwise first of all we would not be here. And we might still be here. I'm pretty sure marine biologists rarely come to Kensington and get interviewed. Well, there's a really good show on at the weekend at the Albert Hall. I'm sure you'd love it. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I may just be bitter and never show up. If you, if you hadn't have gone into it, you would have probably got into it after this weekend. All right. Let's say it, that happens. Yeah. Okay. So I'm speaking to the other people, too. So I would have mentioned marine, marine biologist friend that I just interviewed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. It could have happened. Yeah. You'd be like, my life started one day on on the street it's in London. All heated room. Yeah. <laughs> Outside but inside somehow. Yep. It's, it's kind of odd. Yeah. What do they use this for? I don't know. It's, I guess, for filming my show. I, I think it's so. oh. been custom built. Beautiful. I was really lucky because the first time I did this, Dan Patterson didn't let me back to my own show till the next season and then Dan. nightmare. And don't and get I me started on him. I haven't got enough film for it. Now, what are your favourite games uh, to be involved in on the show? Um, the one that's been consistent, a consistent favourite, has been the uh, the greatest hits, because it would always give uh, Ryan and I a chance to sort of goof around and banter, and then hand over to these amazing uh, musical improvisers. Yeah. So it was like the only game where I got to be a participant and also uh, an audience member, because. Yeah, because as I watch them do their songs, I am burning with envy and jealousy because I, it, I obviously I can't do it. And so I, I'm trying to watch going, how, how are they doing this? And I still don't know. But um, it, they are amazing. I don't think they ever get enough credit. People are all, always think, well, they're cheating somehow. Uh, and I've thought that, even though I'm the one who's just given them the, the style and the title. It's like, oh, they, oh no, they couldn't have. Uh, but the, yeah, people like Chip and uh, Wayne and Brad and Jeff Davis, I don't think get enough credit for what they actually do. To make up a song that's funny and to make it actually sound good and kind of make fun of the style too. It's an amazing skill. Is there anything that you sort of dread, because sometimes there's audience suggestions, mm -hmm. is there anything that people have been like, no, we can't do that, or I don't know how to do that, or do you just go along with anything? Uh, pretty much, we'll go, I mean, there are certain things. We'll never take proctologist or gynecologist, because people always say that is kind of a funny joke. But if you start doing a sound effects scene about a proctologist, you're going to lose a lot of your audience right away. That goes my next question. <laughs> yes, you don't want it. Uh, so we pretty much, um, we, and, and the beauty of improv is, even if someone gives a suggestion that we know nothing about, because this is, we're making up this little world, whatever we say is true. Yeah. So I, uh, I was doing a scene once, uh, it was with Stephen Frost down at the comedy store, and we we're gonna uh, do this scene, and he said, all right, can I have a historical event? Uh, and we got uh, Charles II abdication speech. He went, great, Colin will do this. And I had no idea. I figured there was an abdication, and uh, there was a king involved. <laughs> But that's it. But so my speech was, uh, uh, I had a dream, and it, it still went all right. The audience liked it, even though, and they, because they were in on the joke that I had no idea what the situation was, and uh, and yet we we kept along. Whatever I said immediately became true. So it became sort of a, a civil rights scene. <laughs> As all the best ones do. Exactly. <laughs> now I also love the news flash where there's like stuff going on behind you on like a green screen and you have to try and guess what it is. Would you say that because you know the other people so well that you can kind of guess what they're describing quicker than if it was like a new person? Uh, yes, uh, just because we usually, I, I mean, usually Ryan's one of the ones giving clues and we have the same reference level so I can, and he usually works it so he doesn't give me anything that I can use <laughs> until maybe a minute in. So it's like, uh, the first minute is me thinking about every word that they've said and trying to figure out, uh, and then as they narrow it down, I go, okay, and it, it's giant frogs uh, humping a dog or something. It's... <laughs> There are some times where you sit back and go, this is what I do for a living. Yeah. <laughs> I've rarely seen Disney film that one, isn't it? Yeah, really, I tell you, it could make them a lot of money. I had a little music. 
Um, so one interesting thing I think about improv is compared to acting or performance or just stand-up comedy is that it's competitive. So is everyone sort of trying to outshine each other a bit or... Because there's infinite points up for grabs. Yes, and you want those points because they're going to help you in retirement. Yeah. Can you cash those in, by the way? No, they're useless. They're absolutely useless. There is... A, I hate to use the word competition because it has a negative connotation. Um, and it, uh, uh, improv is such, um, it's such an ensemble thing. You can't, uh, um, you, you can't destroy what people are doing because you're, you want to make the scene. So the competition comes in. Yes, you want to be funny, but you also want to set up the other person too to make, uh, there's, there's a feeling you get when you have a joke that everyone uh, uh, enjoys in the audience. That feeling is rivaled by, oh, you set up the other person and they do exactly what you hoped that they would do. And you've worked together for that moment and it's just this magical thing where everyone has come together. And so um, there is that competition, but the competition is to make this the best scene ever. Uh, I guess it's like a, you know, a team sport where you know, you have the objective where you want your team to win, but you're still playing with your people. You still want to play at the top of your skills, but you also you, you want everyone on the team to, to be the best they can be. Absolutely. Now, I've always wondered too, when you're, you're watching TV at home or a movie in, in a movie theatre, do you feel compelled to read out the end credits? No. <laughs> no. Never have. I just say, like, fun facts about every single person? Never. Not once, but now that you put that in my head, it may become a thing. Well, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Just what I needed. <laughs> You're very welcome. Because then every time you can be the winner. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay, that's a good way of looking at it. I think so. Yeah, no, it's good. And if there's subtitles in a film, you could probably do it too. Wow, you've really thought these things out. Yeah, I've been watching it since the early 90s. I've yeah. had little else to do. Uh, yeah, that's all I've done since the early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm it's a good thing there's a lot to do though oh yeah no it's, it's yeah. Up nicely uh-huh i can't complain I and mean, here we are <laughs> did it get any better than this no way a freezing cold london morning it's christmas it's so christmassy it is well it's summer if you're watching it in july yeah we're acting yeah we're, we're totally acting yeah, yeah yeah this is an elaborate set when the show finished in the uk it thankfully picked up in the US. Was it sort of easy to transition over to the US, um, a different history carry, uh, was it largely the same? Um, it was largely the same in many ways. It was the same producers, same uh, kind of production staff. Um, the last British series was actually f filmed in Hollywood. Oh wow. So, uh, at that, uh, so a lot of the same crew. Uh, the only difference was um, censorship. Uh, in the UK, there was none <laughs> that we knew of. Uh, nope. Everything got through. With America, they're very touchy about uh, basically sex. Um, so there was a... Oh, sex is quite touchy. Uh, yeah, well, if you're doing it right, yes. Yeah. Um, they would have a censor. Uh, because in America, usually you would send the script to the censor. They would go, no, you can't do this. Yeah. Uh, but because we didn't have a script, the censor would be sitting in the booth. Oh. A and the first, se uh, the first season, uh, we'd be there was, I was doing a scene with Greg uh, where I was supposed to be in love with him. And I, I kissed him. This voice comes, excuse me, stop. Can you make up something else? And I thought, wow. Uh, because in the previous scene I'd killed three women and thrown them out a window. Yeah, yeah. That was absolutely fine. Um, and because of that, Drew would then get um, upset because he had a, a real, uh, he was very touchy about being censored in any way. So he would introduce the next few games with words that you wouldn't be shown on television or in many comedy clubs. Uh, so they, they got to a point where uh, a Dan and the censor came to this agreement where we'll film the show if there's anything that you have problems with we'll talk about it and uh, work it out then and uh, don't stop uh, in the middle which worked out yeah. and it, because of that one of my favorite showbiz lines ever um, after a, a show Dan came up to me and said Colin we lost two pussies but we got a penis <laughs> I, went, <laughs> I love this business exactly yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, because I lived in LA for a while and it always used to amaze me there'd sometimes be action movies on in the morning and you'd see everyone getting shot and blown up and stuff, but then they'd censor out the swearing. I'm like, dying's worse than swearing. Is it? Yeah, the... Uh it's, it's weird the uh, priorities they have and yeah. the, the things that they get so easily offended by and the things they kind of, uh, you know, I, but you look at, not to get into a thing, but you see, uh, you know, with the massive amount of shootings in the States and it, it just, it, it just becomes a thing now as opposed to, and it, but if someone... Um, I don't know, uh, you know, masturbates into a rub, although they're getting much tougher on that than they used to be. <laughs> I mean, in the UK, people don't seem to care about that either, but in the, no. the yeah, don't go on the late bus, it's not good. Oh, good to know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maybe we've just found the solution to the mass shootings is, um, suggest that they may have sworn while they're doing it, and then there'll be a clampdown. Yeah. If we get people to masturbate more, uh, it really throws their aim off. Yeah. Different kinds of guns shooting off all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk to someone about. Bring just yeah, go to speak to America about that. Call up America. Also hydrate, more water. Oh yeah, yeah, but both are important. Yeah. <laughs> now in the show, uh, you're often required or not required, but it's fun to do different accents. Do you ever sort of practice those or just see what noises come out when you're speaking, as I do? Yes, it's not one of my strengths. I actually had an early review when I was in um, doing theater was uh, a reviewer said Colin Mockery should be prohibited by law from ever doing a dialect on stage so I took that to mean well, I'll keep doing it oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should I'm a rule breaker I don't care arrest me everything's a dialect yeah. so uh, I feel if you do it with commitment <laughs> hopefully you can get by yeah. I find it's like my impressions if I say uh, off the top I'm Johnny Depp People go, oh, he's Johnny Depp. Hi, Johnny Depp. Yeah, hi, hi. I was in Pirates of the Caribbean. Wow. I, I'm Johnny Depp. I like dogs. <laughs> oh, Colin's back. Hi, Colin. Hi, um, yeah. <laughs> Where did you go? Shot in the eyes. I know. <laughs> yes, That's incredible. I am a chameleon. Master of transformation. <laughs> yes. Did you film a few scenes uh, that weren't seen in Man on the Moon, the Jim Carrey film? Mm-hmm. I did. Well, what were you playing? Here's my, this is my one fabulous Hollywood story okay. that has a, it, it, it doesn't have an ending that pays off. But um, we had just started doing Whose Line in um, America yeah. and my agent set up a meeting with a casting agent called Francine Maisler, who was, uh, and who still is, uh, one of the biggest casting agents. Um, and so I, I went to her uh, office, I met with her, she goes, hi, hi, how are you? You know, I didn't really, uh, I knew nothing about you, but my assistant is a big fan of your show, so uh, she made me watch it and uh, I, I like it and, hey, wait a minute, she picks up a phone goes, hi, uh, Milo, she you know that part you were thinking about? Uh, I think I got the guy here. And then she hangs up and goes, uh, uh, are you doing anything right now? <laughs> I said, no. So, okay, go over uh, to this address, uh, ask for Milo Foreman. He's directing uh, Man in the Moon with Jim Carrey. There may be a part in it for you. I went, All right. So I go there, uh, Milo Foreman comes up. He goes, uh, come to my trailer, gives me the script. We read the scene and he goes, okay, uh, do you want it? And I went, okay. He said, okay, go to wardrobe. And uh, that was it. Uh, and then the next day I was filming, uh, my scene was with uh, Paul Giamatti. Uh, after uh, Andy Kaufman is diagnosed with cancer, he goes to this sort of new age treatment place in New Mexico. They find out he's terminal, so they decide to kick him out so that he won't die there and sort of get bad publicity to the place. So my character was telling his manager, you have to he has to go yeah. uh, and it was a lovely scene you know I got to work with Paul Giamatti who was lovely uh, Milos Forman was great uh, but unfortunately I guess Jim Carrey felt a little intimidated uh, by my performance and so yeah. it was cut I didn't know Johnny Depp was gonna be there and yeah so uh, thank you Jim <laughs> You've separately also been working with Brad Sherwood for about 17 years touring and doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, you also co-hosted part of the correspondence dinner for the president. How did that go? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was an odd, uh, it was an odd experience. We were, um, this was the year after Stephen Colbert had done it and just had basically destroyed 
uh, the Republican Party and, and George Bush. So I think they felt we should go with someone a lot safer who doesn't do political humor, and uh, that was us. So um, we, uh, we, uh, you know, they investigate, the FBI investigates you, you and then yeah. you're allowed to uh, go. So we, um, we, I think we did two scenes and uh, we did a sound effect scene. We used two uh, famous news anchors, went great. And then we were going to do this uh, rap song. So Brad goes to Carl Rove and says, would you do it? And Carl Rove says, yes. So we do this rap song. It goes good. The next day, we get a call from uh, Carl Rose's office saying, uh, we would like to invite you to the White House. So, no, oh, all right. Yeah. Haven't been there. So um, we go uh, with uh, and our wives were with us, uh, Deb and Shauna. And then, uh, so Carl Rose giving us a tour. And he goes, that's, oh, let's go in here. And my wife, Deb, grabs my arm and goes, it's the Oval Office. It's the Oval Office. I recognize it from the West Wing. <laughs> I was like, okay. So we go in, and President Bush is there. And in the corner is uh, Dick Cheney. I'm not kidding. Going like this. <laughs> it's a little creepy. So uh, President Bush uh, sort of gives us a tour in the history of the thing. Incredibly charming. Uh, very funny. And um, before, he was on before us and did 10 minutes of stand-up. And... Uh, he killed like he just was really funny yeah and at one point I turned to uh, Brad and said my god his timing is really good so we're uh, so he's talking to us and goes I really enjoyed your performance I gotta say I was a little nervous doing my thing in front of you but then Colin when you said to Brad uh, my timing was great it really relaxed me and I thought wow I was like 200 yards away from him he goes I read lips oh, wow. he's like one of the world's best lip readers okay. so immediately I was going what else did we say <laughs> playing back every conversation um, so I have to say even though I was not a uh, fan of his uh, presidency or his policy yeah. I kind of saw um, the man who uh, believed what he was doing was the best thing for the country so it was interesting to get that perspective because you know unlike say I don't know today where you kind of look at the president and goes, I don't think he has any um, sense about the country or anything that doesn't have the word Trump on it. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to get into that <laughs> just immediately. I'm happy to. I, I feel my soul sort of descend. I know. It's been insane. But uh, we'll see what happens. It's very exciting. It is. Things seem to be building up to some sort of thing. And, you know, I, I uh, basically, I've never in my... Because I'm... A, a nice guy. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very supportive. I've never wanted anyone destroyed so much in my life. <laughs> Not just, you know, I don't want to hurt in any way. No. I want destroyed. I want the businesses yeah. laid to ruin. I want him to become a pariah. Well, and the Democrats have the House, and I follow it very intently from the UK, and f fingers crossed it yeah, will be Mueller time soon. Yeah, I'm sure it'll all work out, because it usually does. Yeah. <laughs> and only end brilliantly. Oh, God, yes, yeah. yes. This is going to be so great. Oh. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm mostly just excited about the movie that there'll be one day. Oh, at the very least, it's going to be a great hip-hop musical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't wait for that. Oh, yeah, Trumpington. Yeah. <laughs> Or Kafefi. <laughs> oh my God, there's so many things. <laughs> there's just so many things. It's incredible. Yeah. So, so completely different subject now. Um, I watched your wonderfully heartwarming interview last year with your daughter Kinley. How what was the response like? Um, I have to say the response has been overwhelmingly um, a positive. Uh, you know, there are uh, sometimes I don't know if you know this on social media, there are these negative people yeah. we like to call trolls. Uh huh. So, um, and I always, I always think to myself, don't read the comments, don't read the comments, but you, you can't help it because there, I have to say, as I say, most are overwhelmingly, um, positive. Then you see the ones you go, well, these are just trolls. And then you see the ones that think, you know, I wonder, I, I think maybe I could reach them, um, because it, they just seem to be coming from a place of ignorance yeah. as opposed to hate or whatever uh, they do 
and sometimes it works out, uh, sometimes not so much, but you know, uh, at least you give it a try. Well, exactly. I, I kind of think that negativity always just reflects back on the person it's coming from. Yeah. And you know, it's so much, it's so much easier being at home uh, with your little anonymous picture, uh, typing horrible things to people, yeah. getting out whatever demons you have in your life. Um, but I, uh, again, uh, Kinley's been doing great. Uh, she, uh, I mean, I, I think one of the major worries we had was with uh, telling um, our families because yeah. there was a major conservative element in the family. But we were shocked <laughs> at the amount of love and acceptance. And I think mostly, well, I think the main thing is because they all know who she is. Yeah. So they have that person who they love and who is a lovely person. Um, and so it didn't really make that much of a, of a difference. And I think that's where people who have a problem with it, I'd say go out and meet some trans people. I mean, they probably have and don't realize that. People get, I think the, the thing that get people in, a, in an uproar is they confuse gender with sex. Yeah. Whenever sex gets involved, it immediately becomes something weird. And, and it, it's not that. My thing always is... Uh, you know, all this fear and uh, prejudice all comes from ignorance. G read about it and find out about it. Meet people. Because you see, it's just, it's people like us who just want to be the best they can be and be happy with their lives and be happy with themselves. And that's all everybody wants. Yeah. Everyone's just a person that eats food and watches TV and, you know. Yeah. Watch your stupid videos on the internet. Yeah. Like this one, hi. Or whose line is it anyway, coming to a station near you? You are in London, not only for the show, of course, your primary reason, but also you're doing a show at the Royal Albert Hall, 30 years of whose lines it anyway. Tell me all about it. Um, you know what? I have no idea what we're doing. Exciting. It's going to be, what I find funny is it's five uh, great improvisers, but also five great musical improvisers. Amazing. And me. So th I'm wondering how that's going to play out. It's uh, Josie, Mike McShane, Chip Eston, Jeff uh, Davis, Brad Sherwood, and me. Um, I have no idea what games we're playing. Uh, Dan Patterson is... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a way of saying it without making him seem like a dictator. But there is no way. He is in complete charge. So he'll come up with the games, figure out who's playing what. It'll be basically a live version of Who's Line uh, without the tall guy and the black guy. Well, I'm very much looking forward to watching. I have tickets uh, oh for this Sunday. Yeah, of course. Oh, good. I saw um, last time you were over as well. It was a great show. Oh, who was your favorite? You. Yeah. All right. Well, of course. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to watch your other interviews to see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just going to say the same answer, you. <laughs> oh, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I know, right? Yeah. So, have you got any tips for anyone that wants to get into comedy or improv? My first tip is, if there's anything else you can do that you love doing, do it. Yeah. But, if you're going to do it with the comedy, do it as much as you can. Do it uh, wherever, in front of as many audiences. Uh, don't be afraid to fail because that's where you find out where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are. And there is something about uh, failing that's fun in a very horrible way. Um, like all the guys from Who's Line, we've done shows together where not just fail, but the only people laughing are us uh, watching each other die miserably of age. Um, but you, you learn from those moments and it makes you stronger and then you become more fearless because you think, well, it can't go any worse than this. <laughs> so let's just go for it. And it gives you a sort of a freedom. Uh, you know, people get, oh, it's like, oh, no, dying is good. Absolutely. I mean, not, you know, not in a physical sense, but yeah, uh, no. yeah in comedy, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, what are you working on next? You're still touring with Brad. You're going to go home and have a bit of a rest after this epic tour you've been. No. Uh, okay. What happens? We're, we, yeah, we go home, uh, Christmas uh, holiday. Then uh, I have a couple of shows with Brad. I also have a show with my wife Deb that we do, which is kind of a uh, us talking about our marriage, but it also involves uh, doing improv uh, with people. Um, then I think I'm doing a couple. Of, I do uh, a lot of movies where. People will call and say, we have no money. Yeah. And I'll go, oh yeah, okay, I'll do it. So I do a lot of those. But um, 
you know, things always, last year I did a production of King Lear. Wow. With uh, a lot of Stratford actors and me. Uh, I played the fool. And it was um, one of those great experiences because it uh, was way out of my comfort zone. Yeah. It terrified me. But it was like one of the best experiences of my life. So I'm always, at this age, I'm looking for things that take me outside of what I feel comfortable doing. I find that's what I do. Uh, when Brad and I are doing our show, we try to make it as uncomfortable for us as possible because we find that's when we have the most fun and that's when the inspiration comes because it's almost like you get into survival mode. It's like I have to, <laughs> I have to live through this show. So it really uh, inspires and pushes you. That's amazing. And finally, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Hey, thanks for watching uh, Sarah O'Connell and uh, my fans around the world. Uh, thanks for uh, making a Who's Line a part of your life and giving me a career. I really appreciate it. Uh, you've given me a chance to do what I love all around the world and uh, there's nothing more fun for me than making uh, people laugh. So thank you for laughing. Even if you're just pushing it and pretending, it's made me feel good. <laughs> well, Colin Mockery, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you for everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up, and I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Hydrate. <laughs>